Firefighters in Cuba continue their battle to put out the blaze at Matanza's old tank farm. Colombia's President Gustavo Petro reaffirmed Monday that peace talks with the National Liberation Army will resume. Sabarisio Blas authorities announced the signing of a decree on holding a referendum on joining the Russian Federation. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Tesoro Studios in Havana, Cuba. We we'll begin with the news. In Cuba, firefighters continue to work to extinguish the blaze at the Superfield tanker base in Matanzas. Helicopters of the Revolutionary Armed Forces keep working with while they load water from the nearby Bay of Matanzas and spread it over the affected area. The governor of Matanza, Mario Sabine, said that several teams of firemen were working in a risky terrain, but they are not desisting in their efforts to extinguish the flames. On Monday morning, a third tank at the super tanker's oil depot collapsed after fuel spill from the second tank. Venezuelan and Mexican experts are working together with Cuban authorities to battle the fire. A new explosion has reportedly taken place at the Matanzas oil tank farm around 5 p.m. Monday. No details about the nature or cause of the explosion has yet been released by authorities. Three tanks out of the eight in that area have already been compromised by the flames, and a risk of another one being reached by the fire has worried firefighters and authorities who try to keep it cool. A little more clearly, we can explain that in fact the risk we had announced actually occurred and the fire in the second tank compromised the third one, which is now on fire, functioning basically as a clean torch or a stove. And that is what is happening right now. With very little visibility given the amount of smoke. So after the fire, we all saw what happened was that the content of tank number two spilled and increased the areas of fire and expanded by gravity and set the grass around a flame. That was the situation yesterday. Very complex, with three tanks on fire, fuel pouring again from number one, so that functions also as a stove. So the area of fire of the four tanks is very wide, almost occupying three of them. The expressions of solidarity from other countries continue in the face of the terrible accident that occurred in the industrial zone of the city of Matanza, some 80 kilometers east of the capital of the country, Havana. On this occasion, the president of the Arab Republic of Sahrawi, His Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Ghali, sends a message of solidarity and support to the Cuban people. In a note addressed to the Cuban government, he expressed my condolences at this critical moment and my firm conviction that the Cuban people will successfully overcome the consequences of this dramatic episode. Pope Francis lamented on Monday the fire that broke out in Matanzas and conveyed his closeness to those affected. Pope Francis shares his spiritual closeness to the Cuban people and to all the families of those affected and prays to the Lord to grant them strength in this moment of pain and to sustain the work of extinguishing and searching with these sentiments. He imparts to them from his art the comforting apostolic blessing, concluded the text, sent to the Bishop of Olguin and President of the Episcopal Conference of Cuba, Emilio Aranguren Echevarria. The message is signed by the Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin. Member states of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America People's Trade Treaty condemned the illegal request of the U.S. Justice Department to seize a Boeing 747 aircraft owned by Venezuela. Alba TCP Executive Secretary Sasha Llorenti posted on Twitter an official statement from the Bolivarian Alliance, adding that the illegitimate and illegal seizure order is a result of the unilateral coercive measures imposed by the U.S. government, coercive measures that threaten the sovereignty of Venezuela and violate the fundamental principles of the United Nations Charter. The alliance condemns the continuation of unilateral coercive measures against the people and government of Venezuela and calls on the international community to demand their immediate lifting. Alba TCP supports the legal measures taken by the Venezuelan government to safeguard its assets.
Haiti's prime minister Ariel Henry lost support from part of the democratic and popular sector that led to massive mobilizations of 2019 and 2020. After an emergency assembly, several members of the coalition decided to withdraw from the September 11th agreement promoted by the Haitian prime minister and the dialogue commission to start negotiations with opposition parties. Amid demonstrations called after the resolution was announced, members of the coalition warned Ariel Henry that he has 100 days to re-establish security in the country and alleviate the humanitarian crisis that affects the Caribbean country. Although the decision to withdraw from was taken without the presence of the coalition's main representatives, the agreement is terminated. Brazil's former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva leads the voting intentions for the presidential elections to be held in October. According to a survey commissioned by BTG Bank and produced by FSB Communication Company, the former president remains as the first voting option with 41% of support. The poll also showed that President Jair Bolsonaro remains in second place with 34%. The polls also revealed that the distance between the two candidates was reduced by at least 6 percentage points since in last July survey Lula da Silva had 44 percent support while the current head of state was polled with 31 percent. Gas workers in Uruguay face Monday a lawsuit from Rio Gas Company for having participated in union actions. After a few weeks of conflict, the company imposed sanctions on the workers in May, so the union carried out a series of measures to try to get this employer action lifted. 75 gas union workers were summoned to court to testify this month, a fact that was described as a new case of union persecution. This process has been denounced by different actors of the civil society and they pointed out as a persecution process against those who exercise their legitimate right to social protest. We're going to take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, held a meeting with leaders of guarantor countries of the country's peace process with the aim of resuming dialogues with the National Liberation Army. During his first day as head of state, Petro met with the president of Chile, Gabriel Boric, who ratified his commitment to remain as one of the guarantor countries of the peace process. The purpose is to revive the protocols that were agreed upon and thus start this new stage that seeks total peace in Colombia. In this sense, Gustavo Petro ratified the Republic of Cuba as the venue for the talks, a desire he expressed to Cuba's foreign minister Bruno Rodriguez, given that the peace delegation of the insurgent group is currently on the island. In concrete terms, what we have is a desire to continue the processes initiated during the Santos government and enrich them, first by complying with those that were signed, the processes with the FARC. Secondly, by continuing those that were interrupted, one with the ELN very early on, which did not even manage to sit down in a legal negotiation. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador said that for the moment he will not meet with the new president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro. However, he expressed his good wishes and assured that Petro's victory means a historical change in the nation. Not now, but of course we are very happy because it is a historical change in Colombia. I have already spoken in another occasion with what conservatism has meant in Colombia. Very strong, very hard. And historically, it has prevented the changes that are needed in Colombia. The Mexican head of state, referring to the Israeli bombings against Palestine, stressed that innocent lives are being lost and said that the only way out is through dialogue. We must stop the war confrontation. We must choose dialogue, not the use of force. We must avoid confrontation. And it is evident 
Innocent people are losing their lives. In Mexico, rescue operations continue for the 10 miners trapped in a coal mine in the state of Coahuila. National Coordinator of Civil Protection, Laura Velasquez, reported that the Navy uses specialized personnel and an underwater drone equipped with a high-resolution camera and light in order to search the water levels in the mine galleries without putting rescuers at risk. In this context, authorities detail that the first phase of rescue operations consists of lowering the water level in the access shaft flooded in the collapsed structures. The incident occurred on August 3rd after one of the gallery walls collapsed, causing the miners to be trapped at a depth of 60 meters. Authorities of the Ukrainian Zaporizhia Oblast signed on Monday a decree to hold a referendum to annex the territory to Russia. Evgeny Balitsky, leader of the Oblast, announced the initiative during the forum, We Together with Russia. Members of the main council of the military civic administration of Zaporizhia said the city will be protected from any attacks. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned that Kiev will withdraw from any negotiation process with Moscow in case of holding referendums in the territories controlled by the Russian military. And Russian Defense Ministry officials revealed that terrorist groups are preparing new provocations, faking aerial bombings against civilians to blame the Syrian and Russian armies in the Idlib province. The Russian Coordination Center denounced that members of the so-called White Helmets Terrorist Organization, in cooperation with Al-Nusra Front Terrorist Group, are preparing the scenes in the town of Katan. The Russian Coordination Center pointed out that these actions seek to accuse the Russian Air Force and the Syrian Arab Army for carrying out attacks on civilians and infrastructure in the province. Russia's defense ministry exposed over the past few years several scenarios in which terrorists plan to use chemical weapons in several locations in that country in coordination with the White Helmets terrorist organization and with the support of Western intelligence services. We have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. On Monday, the government of Qatar reported that after five months of negotiations, Chad's transitional military council and rebel groups agreed to sign a historic peace deal. Doha hosts the signing ceremony to which the highest representatives of the African Union, various regional organizations, and ambassadors from diplomatic missions are summoned. The agreement, which includes a commitment to a ceasefire, the cessation of military operations by the transitional council, and the initiation of a disarmament process, paved the way for the start of a broad national reconciliation dialogue. Nearly 40 political movements have signed the document. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, thanked the Qatari government for its role as mediator. The Egypt brokered truth between Israel and the Palestinian resistance forces in Gaza has ended. The recent intense bombing has left at least 44 people dead, including 15 children. When Palestine recorded 43 deaths, six of which were children, and more than 300 wounded, Egypt negotiated a ceasefire between the Ministry of Defense and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. After Mohammed al-Hindi, head of the group's political department, confirmed the agreement, Tel Aviv reaffirmed it under conditions of responding forcefully in case of a violation. The truce began at 11.30 p.m. local time on Sunday, despite a series of Israeli air raids and attacks up until the last minute. On Monday, thousands of Shiite Muslims supporting Yemen's Houthis gathered in the capital Sana to mark Ashura and to show support for Palestinian people under Israel bombing. The marchers mark Ashura a 10-day period commemorating the killing of Prophet Muhammad's grandson Iman Hussein in the Battle of Karbala in 680. The massive rally also comes in support of Palestinians following a three-day deadly conflict between Israel and Islamic Jihad militants in the Gaza Strip. Starting on Friday, Israel had launched a heavy aerial and artillery bombardment of Islamic Jihad positions in Gaza. In addition to those killed, Gaza and health officials said over 300 people were wounded in the Palestinian enclave, which is run by the Islamic group Hamas. Millions of Kenyans prepared to vote in Tuesday's presidential elections, hoping the polls run in peace as tension mounts. 
Tuesday's polls will see a tight race between Deputy President William Ruto and Riola Odinga, a veteran opposition leader now backed by the ruling party. With the specter of post-election unrest looming over the polls, many welcome a final pledge by both men on Sunday to respect the result and not trigger a repeat of the violence that followed votes in 2007 and 2017. The campaign has been dominated by rigging claims, but both candidates call for a peaceful vote. No Kenyan presidential election has gone unchallenged in the last 20 years, and the discord has previously led to violence either between communities or at the hands of police. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in South Africa to begin his free nation tour of the continent. Blinken's arrival in Africa followed his trip to Asia, where he visited Cambodia and the Philippines. The U.S. Secretary of State visited the Hector Peterson Memorial in Soweto Township on the outskirts of Johannesburg, where he laid a wreath at a memorial which honors the students killed in 1976 when protesting South Africa's racist regime of apartheid. Upon completing his tour of South Africa, Blinken is expected to travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and finally to Rwanda. Mongolian President Ukna Kurelsuk on Monday reaffirmed his country's commitment to the One China Principle during his meeting with visiting Chinese State Council and Foreign Minister Wang Ji in Ulaanbaatar. The Mongolian head of state also stated that the affairs of Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet and Xinjiang are all China's internal affairs, noting that this is Mongolia's consistent policy and there will be no changes in this regard. Thanks to important consensus reached between both nations, several bilateral economic and trade volume agreements have been achieved. Mongolia's president expressed his gratitude to China for providing it with multiple batches of vaccines and anti-pandemic supplies in spite of its own difficulties. The two high government officials signed cooperation documents and witnessed the signing of cooperation documents in terms of railway ports, health and quarantine. The Sur English continues to grow. Its signal now reaches Europe. You can order from your cable dealer or tune it yourself. These parameters that you see on screen are in place since July 1st, and quite soon further changes will be implemented for the signals in the Middle East and Africa. Now more than ever, the world connects to us, and our stories are heard in other faraway nations. These new multi platform will continue providing truth for content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience. And like this, we have come to the end of this news group, where you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.